it's good to think through that because um, having a, like a United Nations, there's usually a centralized control. So there's humans at the top. There's committees and uh, usually like leaders emerge as singular figures that then can become corrupted by power. And it's just a really important, it feels like a really important thought experiment and something to really rigorously think through. How can you construct systems of government that uh, are stable enough to push us towards less and less war and less and less unstable and another tough word, which is unfair of application of force. You know, it's, that's really at the core of the question that we're trying to figure out as humans. As our weapons get better and better and better at destroying ourselves, it feels like it's important to think about how we minimize the over-application or unfair application of force. There's other elements that come into play, too. You and I are discussing this at the very high intellectual level of things, but there's also a tail wagging the dog element to this. So think of a society of warriors, uh, a tribal society from a long time ago. Um, how much do the fact that you have warriors in your society and that their reason for existing, what they take pride in, what they train for, um, what their status in their own civilization, how much does that itself drive the responses of that society, right? Um, uh, how much do you need war to legitimize warriors? Um, you know, that's the old argument that you get to, and we've had this in the 20th century too, that that the creation of arms and armies creates a an incentive to use them, right? And and that they themselves can drive that incentive as as a justification for their reasons for existence, you know? Um, that's where we start to talk about the interactivity of all these different elements of society upon one another. So when we talk about you know governments and war, well, you need to take into account the various things those governments have put into place in terms of systems and armies and things like that to, to protect themselves, right? For reasons we can all understand, but they exert a force on your, your range of choices, don't they? It's true. You're making me realize that uh, in my upbringing, and I think upbringing of many, warriors are heroes. You know, to me, I don't know where that feeling comes from, but the sort of uh, die fighting <laughs> is, uh, is an honorable way to die. It feels like that. I've always had a problem with this because as a person interested in military history, I, right. the distinction is important. Um, and I try to make it at different levels. So at base level, the, the people who are out there on the front lines doing the fighting, uh, to me, those people can be compared with police officers and firemen and people that fire persons. Um, <laughs> yeah. But but I mean, people that are are um, involved in an ethical uh, attempt to perform a task, which ultimately uh, one can see in many situations as being a saving sort of task, right? Or or, or if nothing else, a self sacrifice for what they see as the greater good. Now. I draw a distinction between the individuals and the entity that they're a part of, a military, and I certainly draw a distinction between the military and then the entire, for lack of a better word, military-industrial complex that that service is a part of. Uh, I feel a lot less um, moral attachment to uh, to those upper echelons than I do the people on the ground. The people on the ground could be any of us and have been in a lot of, you know, we have a very professional uh, sort of military now where it's a very... Uh, a subset of the population, but in other periods of time, we've had conscription and drafts, and and it hasn't been a subset of the population. It's been the population, right? And so it is the society oftentimes going to war. And I make a distinction between those warriors and the entities either in the system that they're part of, the military, or the people that control the military at the highest political levels. I feel um, a lot less moral attachment to them, and, and I have a much harsher about how I feel about them. I do not consider um, the military itself to be heroic, and I do not consider the military-industrial complex to be heroic. I do think that is a tail wagging the dog situation. I do think that draws us into looking at um, military endeavors as a solution to the problem much more quickly than we otherwise might. And to be honest, to tie it all together, I actually look at the, at the victims of this as the soldiers we were talking about, I mean, if you if you set a fire 
to send firemen into to fight, mm -hmm. um, then I feel bad for the firemen. I feel like you've abused the trust that you give those people, right? So when when people talk about war, I always think that the people that we have to make sure that a war is really necessary uh, in order to protect are the people that you're going to send over there to fight that. The, the greatest victims in our society of war are often the warriors. So I, I, in my mind, um, you know, when we see these people coming home from places like Iraq, a place where I would have made the argument and did at the time that we didn't belong. To me, those people are victims, and I know they don't like to think about themselves that way because it runs totally counter to the to the ethos. But if you're sending people to protect this country's shores, those are heroes. If you're sending people to go do something that they otherwise probably don't need to do, but they're there for political reasons or anything else you want to put in that's not defense related, well, then you've made victims of our heroes. And so I, I, I feel like we do a lot of talk about our troops and our soldiers and stuff, but we don't treat them as valuable right. as we as 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 the rhetoric makes them sound. Otherwise, we would be more um, we would be much more careful about where we put them. If you're going to send my son, and I don't have a son, I have daughters, but if you're going to send my son into harm's way, I'm going to demand that you really need to be sending him into harm's way, and I'm going to be angry at you if you put him into harm's way if he doesn't if, if it doesn't warrant it. And so I have much more suspicion about the system that sends these people into these situations where they're required to be heroic than I do the people on the ground that I look at as um, either uh, the people that are defending us, uh, you know, in, in situations like this, you know, the Second World War, for example, or or the people that um, turn out to be the individual victims of a system where they're just a cog in a machine and the machine doesn't really care as much about them as as the the rhetoric and the propaganda uh, would insinuate.